Queer Relationships, an IM clinic podcast devoted to helping you, the LGBTQ plus community, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Okay, picture this. It looks like they're sitting in the bottom of their New York apartment, colored with amazing fashion and really cool glasses. And these two men sit in front of me, beaming with joy. Their sense of humor is unlike anything I've ever seen. You can tell they are best friends working and cultivating their own inside jokes over several years. And although they look like best friends, they wear wedding rings. And their TikTok is full of the same kind of humor and joy that I saw sitting in front of me. With today's guests, we cover topics like being authentic, social media, hookup culture, polyamory, but mostly what does it take to make a marriage last? I find these two men such a beautiful example for all of us to rely on in terms of what does it look like to be married in the queer community. I find their example just so exemplary and And there's this part in me that finds such comfort from knowing that other gay men have been successful at something I've still yet to try, this big thing called marriage. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Let's take a listen. Just kind of thumbing through some of your TikToks, it looks like y'all have had just such a fun love story. I mean, watching some of your pictures, it looks like in many ways, the two of you have grown up next to each other. Yeah, we pretty much did. In a way we have, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think uh, part of what made it so easy to stay together so long is that we met so young that I think our personalities, like, we're, the, our personalities were still forming, and so we were able to... Grow together. Grow together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we didn't come into it with, like, a lot of... Um, background or yeah. chuffa as they say <laughs> or um uh, bad habits bad or habits w- relationship uh, habits yeah. i mean we're talking about relationship or presumed yeah. thoughts concepts ideas um but we both knew we wanted a relationship we did well after, no we didn't well after <laughs> i did he didn't <laughs> not 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 in the first what was it uh few weeks a few weeks yeah i had yeah. to convince him he yeah. wanted to just have some fun yeah that's why i don't know if you saw that video that's why i made him wait like almost a month before we you know took it to the next level as they say on fraser uh-huh. so i need i wanted him to fall in love first and so that, that i wanted a relationship mm-hmm. he wasn't looking for that yeah I, I was in yeah he was in love at first i was in lust but mm-hmm. it didn't take long a few, like you always say a few weeks for me to turn around for sure. I, was, see, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't stubborn. I didn't have that. Yeah, you know. that's true. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I have a particular vantage point as a therapist, and I wonder if you guys share in this vantage point, but to think of a relationship that has been so strong and so deeply rooted in, in many ways, and to watch now um, people in their 20s and 30s have such a hard time making relationships last it um i hear so often you know gay men or queer people just saying i want to fall in love i want to feel safe i want to build a family and yet it's so incredibly challenging whether it's um i mean from from a clinical perspective i have so many ideas like ambivalence or hookup culture and um, different shame, all the things that we kind of have to navigate through to make relationships work. But what has that been like um, for the two of you watching friends and younger generations of gay people um, kind of navigate dating with such kind of chaos when it was seemingly pretty easy for the two of you? Yeah, because what I find interesting is that younger people are often saying to us, oh, wow, it must have been so hard for you being gay back in the 80s. But no, it wasn't it wasn't hard at all. It wasn't any harder than being straight. We had a great time. I, I, they seem much more, uh, I don't know, troubled today or much more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> thanks for the help, Dwayne. <laughs> like, 
I'm, I'm thinking of the question oh. and what my response is like. I think when we see, you know, when we see younger people, can you sort of have, has, I, I find it maddening and, and, and so unfortunate that they have so much uh, um, preconceived notions of what it means to be what it means gay to be gay, or... what it means to be a relationship, what it means to date, what it means to uh, be yourself. And uh, where all these things came from, I don't know, except I, I, when I can piece things together, it seems to come from our culture, our society, uh, technology, um, and we had social none of that. media. And again, we didn't have any of that. And again, the, the whole uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, let me reveal my life, something which it isn't, something that is better than it is. How can you ever find out who you really are when you're presenting something that isn't real? Mm -hmm. My most beautiful picture, my, you know, and uh, I love this lifestyle that I live, right. whatever. And, and again, a lot of that comes from pop culture. The music uh, is very empty that these younger people have to listen to. I mean, when we grew up, our music and even our television gave us uh, a sense of being, a sense of who we are, right. non-materialistic. Materialism was, you know, considered, yeah, it, it was, it was a you didn't want it. I mean, it was just bad. It was commercialism. It was crass. Um, so again, when I see what they have to deal with and what they have to remove from themselves to, to make themselves, I, I hate to use a trite word, but authentically to make themselves authentically themselves, it's a lot that they have to go through. And I feel sorry for them because of all this pollution pressure. and garbage and pressure that's been thrown on them. They often ask us, younger gay people, LGBT people, uh, what, you know, um, what advice can you give us? Or how can, how can I enter the gay world when I'm coming out? And how should I be? We're like, just be yourself. The answer we always give, it's so basic. Just be yourself. They don't seem to be able to grasp that. They're like, no, I have to fit in. I have to, if I don't fit in, I'm so going to be much pressure to fit in. Yeah. Whereas when we were coming up, the pressure to fit in wasn't there. The pressure was there, not pressure, but the, 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 the oh. feeling was to be your, to, to, to be yourself, to be an individual, to not fit in. Well, another, and another question we often get is who were your gay idols growing up? Like there were no, we had no gay idols. I mean, that was not a thing. So I think that helped us because we, mm -hmm look to anyone to think, oh, I need to be this way. I need to act that way. We just, we developed our own personalities and our own way of being. And another thing I noticed that they do is that the code switching, you know, acting more flamboyantly with, your, with, yeah, with their friends and then yeah. acting a different way with their straight friends. We've never done that. We've only ever been the same no matter who we're around, whether we're in a work environment or with family or friends or so I think it's just, it's a very different uh, culture they've grown up in and there's a lot of pressure. And so as far as relationships, I don't know, they have, they feel a lot of pressure to be a certain way and they have expectations on the other person to be a certain way. We didn't have those expectations. We just let it happen. And being such an instant society, if that immediately th that the, the person, let's say you're, you're, you're dating or whatever, or, or you're interested in a starting a relationship immediately, if there's something that's not right, uh, they just the shut idea it down. Is throw it away. You know, it's like delete, you know, scroll, right. scroll to the next person, delete. I right. mean, you have to work on relationships. Uh, and, and, and again, I, again, I feel sorry because it's so much more difficult for them. And, and they, they have this concept of, you know, I want to be my authentic self. But I don't think they really understand what they're saying when they say they're my authentic self. They they they're afraid. They're they're afraid to find out who that is, and they need help in developing mm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost like a a safe uh, playground, a sandbox of sorts to to say I get to play around with what my authenticity is in order to understand that it's actually authentic, mm. you know, kind of this, um, yeah. this uh, maybe echo chamber in a good way to say, I'm not relying on the influences of social media to inform my authenticity, but I'm right. Right. allowing it to blossom from within. And we all go through that as we develop and we're growing up and, you know, uh, it, it, whether it's, you know, we're relating yeah. to, uh, an aunt, an uncle, a father, a mother, something that we see, oh, 
um, you know, these are qualities that I like. So, uh, right. you know, I'm going to take those on. I mean, we, we have to develop. Yes. But I, I think the problem is the the social media and the, the, the that's their influence the culture no, not... being an influence, which it's not most ideal. It, it's not, you know, it's, it's not, not real. It's not, it's not, it's not real. a human connection kind of thing. It's an, it's a technology connection. <laughs> I think that's a problem. Am I going away? I talk yes. with my hands a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, once you get him started, like I was like, <laughs> let your run get to shut up there. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do, I do. I'm thinking of kind of my own development. Um, you know, obviously I was a teenager and a young adult without social media. Um, and I think, I mean, I was, what, a junior, sophomore in college when Facebook finally hit the campus that I was on at Colorado University. Um, but to think, to, to watch social media kind of swing in, right, as I was hitting my 20s and how that definitely created the perception to kind of curate my life. You know, I had to decorate my bedroom in a certain way so that my selfies there looked really cool. Or I had to have the right car, the cool haircut, and the, the cool Warby Parker glasses at the time to create this persona of what my life really looked like. Um, I think we can take wow. that even a step further and think about if my one option now for dating, hypothetically, is Grinder or Tinder, and that I'm going to kind of curate this physical environment to portray something about my emotional environment or my, my maturity level. That is a lot of pressure, I think, on oh, yeah. younger generations to say, what is my authentic self? In other words, maybe something like, what is my social media self? And those two can, yeah. Yeah. it sounds like you're saying those can oftentimes be perceived as one and the same. Yeah, and they, right, and they can also be against each other. Mm -hmm. They can be up, you know. They could uh, be conflict. Right. You mm -hmm. know, they can be a, create a conflict. Absolutely, um, yeah. within someone. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, something kind of perked my ears earlier on in our conversation, and I kind of came up with the question of what does relationship mean to both of you. The idea of being in a relationship or creating one or having one. Um, I think number one, and people ask us this all the time, <laughs> it's having someone with whom you could be completely honest and tell anything to. Like even if it's something that you think it's going to hurt their feelings or it's going to be humiliating for you, it doesn't matter. You have that person that you can feel safe just saying anything. And I was that way with Dwayne from the start. It took a little while longer for him to open up more just because of his background, his family didn't do that, but mine did. So I think that's a huge um, factor. It's a huge and important factor in why we've been able to stay together so long. And that's what a relationship to me means. Someone, not, in addition to, of course, love and friendship and trust and all that stuff. Um, and sex, but no, which is not, none of those are necessary. I don't think as, as, as necessary as openness and trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds I think like, every, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, in, in every relationship really needs that, um, openness, trust, mm -hmm. um, Really is Anyone with any relationship basis. we knew that broke up or that they had conflict, it was because there was a secret, there was mistrust, there was a lie. Even if it was something small, I think it can grow and grow into something big mm -hmm. because there's that feeling of mistrust. Mm -hmm. And one other thing. Betrayal. Yeah. And a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not taking yourself too seriously. Yes. Being able to laugh with your partner. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned that from my parents. My parents were married for 60 years and they were laughing all the time right till the end. So my father died. So uh, I think that's that I learned that. And I think that's really important. Like we laugh constantly. And I guess there's we're going to be laughing as soon as this interview is over. We're going to be cracking up hysterically <laughs> at the stupid thing you said. She said yes. <laughs> well, there's also we we both came <laughs> from uh, families where our parents stayed together. 
their whole for life. life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. We both have fathers that have passed away. So um, that was a big influence. So again, that's, that's something that's an influence on you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In my notes here, I kind of wrote, it sounds like you guys are saying relationships equal vulnerability and vulnerability. Yes. yes. Honesty, you know, kind of in this uh, uh, video you mentioned. Yeah. I'm sorry. The video you mentioned that we did the I love you versus love you. That's what we were saying. The adding the I that's, that's showing vulnerability. And a lot of people are afraid to, to feel that or to show that. And once you can be vulnerable with someone, you, you're open. You can really there's love a them. Deep connection. Mm-hmm. You open up. You feel there's the vulnerability will equal that trust. Right. Right. Yeah. I come um, so with my religious background. Right. I have this one phrase that I still hold on to, and I love it so much. But it's um, they were naked and unashamed, and taking yeah. that that little phrase and making it not necessarily this physical nakedness, but this emotional. This, this authenticity that I am not standing behind a facade and because I am completely naked in front of you in all of these ways, I am therefore unashamed. You see everything and it is still beautiful. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And so many people will listen to that phrase and turn it into smut. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not about having only fans. Yes. <laughs> In order for vulnerability to be, to produce, to, to kind of flourish, the two of you must have been safe for one another. You know, it's really hard to do vulnerability when we're unsafe. Where do you think that safety came from? Hmm. <sighs> Let me think. Yeah. Do you think that safety came from? Probably prior to even meeting each other. Maybe the safety of a of a home a, a home life where has to be our upbringing. Yeah, the upbringing where you didn't feel um, unheard or unseen, or you um, were able to express yourself, or at least uh, yeah, be yourself growing up, um, whatever that is you know a, a little brat or a happy little kid or uh someone who wants to just play alone and not you know join a team you know and whatever that would be gives you a sense of who you are and can be which then i think allows you to uh our parents gave us such a safe our parents gave us such a strong sense of self that i remember thinking when i was a teenager and i was going to come out to them i remember thinking if they don't accept me, then I don't accept them. I'll just, I mean, it works both ways, but I didn't have to do that. They were fine. But I mean, because of that, that upbringing from them, I had such a strong, someone's self-esteem and such a strong sense of self that I thought you have to accept me as I am. And I came from the same, I came from this before meeting him. I had the same experience with myself. It's like, if I'm not going to be accepted as as gay, I'm, that's fine. And I still am going to be. And, you know, I, I don't need. I don't need I, you. I don't need that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, unfortunately, we both didn't have to experience that, which again makes it easier, I guess, to to I don't know, just to navigate life, having your family backing you and behind you, with you. You know. Does that answer the question about we safety? The question? If feeling safe with each other? For sure. The the yeah. way that I hear it is that you were able to provide safety because in a sense, you were aware of your own worth. So you could easily cherish the worth of someone else as opposed to someone who's insecure saying, I need someone who's better than me or the trophy guy to compliment me. And that there's a lot of tension in using someone to prop your own sense of self up. But it's just a mistake. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, and you put that perfectly, yes. When yes. we were really young, like still like 18 and 19, he had all these like vintage muscle magazines that he loved to look at. And or most of those cult magazines with all the big, very yeah. big muscular guys. Yeah. And I used to ask him, I wasn't really jealous. I, don't, I wasn't jealous, but I would say, why are you with me if that's what you like? And he would always say, because I love you, because it, that's this two different things. Yeah, it is. That's, you know, that's an image. That's but I think a lot of guys... 
Yeah. A lot of guys today, they're looking for that perfect image. They don't want to be seen with someone that's lesser than them. They need to be seen with someone that's hot or whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And that, that leads to disaster, I think, mm -hmm. or can. And then also a lot of people will enter a relationship, only enter a relationship with somebody who's of their economic level or who, you know, uh, education level. I mean, uh, love comes everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it comes out of anywhere and everywhere. Mm -hmm. I know I, I did this early on in my 20s, and I definitely hear it in the lives of my clients, but saying, if I'm curating this, the, the room, right, with the perfect decor and it looks good in my selfies and then I can, I can run enough and lift enough weights to make my body look good in my pictures, but now I need to go out there and find a man who looks good in my pictures, who looks good on paper. Oh my God, yes. And kind of thinking like my life isn't complete or even I'm not valuable unless I have someone who's picture worthy picturesque if you right, right and i definitely agree with you that i've learned that totally contradicts the idea that love can come from anywhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> excuse me so it's like yes. what you were saying social media has made it really difficult so difficult for people to see past this to even yeah. understand past right. it because <laughs> they think that this is the only way what they see through social media mm -hmm. um and even within our culture which is so geared towards you know beauty and uh status and uh luxury and you know that's like like that's why we were saying every time these young people say to us or they see the old videos of us from the 80s they say wow it must have been so hard for you to be gay and be in a relationship and be open back then no it was easy you've got it hard they don't even realize they've got it hard and it's it's a sad thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we came of age uh, just during the, um, the AIDS crisis. Right. And same year. Everyone thinks that that made it so horrible and morbid and which it was. But there's the other side of it is that we became activists and we were involved. We had a purpose. We had a drive. Mm -hmm. It kept us um, it kept us focused and yeah. moving forward mm -hmm. rather than, you know, being the misery and dwelling on misery. Dwelling yeah. on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And living in a city like New York, there was a lot of that. But it was oh, yeah. also very easy to be, be an activist because we're in the city of New York. You know, yeah. this is where things are happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. <laughs> we always did it all together. Mm -hmm. In that line, have you guys seen there's the, the shift, right, in dating and, and that make social media making it harder? Do you see a shift in the way that younger generations are talking about or engaging sex that may be different hmm. like you mean because of the app the pick the social the um hookup apps yeah or because of prep yeah or, or because of prep yeah or because of you know like more social acceptance less shame but that doesn't necessarily we're complete always in every paradigm moving in the right direction there is of I notice again we're, we're going back to social media this is where we see everything now yeah. you know, on social media uh, for um, people to be so much more open with um, their like sexual fantasies fetishes uh, uh, showing them off uh, and almost <sighs> It's hard now because we've been uh, involved in TikTok recently. So you see a lot, you're seeing like the world through the TikTok app. Um, and there's just, I, I, I for, you know, and, and on TikTok, you can get caught in different uh, sort of uh, worlds, the, you know, the, the, the gay so man. So we're in world, the gay TikTok. The cat right. world, the, the, this, you know, the different. Right. And with the, the gay men TikTok, there's a lot of, sexuality as if that is the basis of who they are their sex is everything that they are yes it, that 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 the only topic them. they bring up yeah it's their only topic it's and uh, again i wonder now is is this being done just for tiktok or do they really feel that way that's what we keep wondering is this really how but most younger is, gay guys think or is it just for the for tiktok right and, and if they're doing that's the only thing they're doing on tiktok then it makes you wonder how is that then seeping into 
their psyche that, uh, you know, I am nothing but a sexual being. Yeah. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's a small part of, again, of who you are. Absolutely. It's rare to see a gay, a younger gay guy on TikTok who doesn't turn around and shake his butt. I, I mean, it's fine. It's cute, but. It's I and, it's and, like, and it's 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 good to be self confident. Yes, but then sometimes it also borders on narcissism. Some of it, right. which again, narcissism is not a healthy thing. Um, it's good, you know. Yeah, it's be, oh, I uh, you know, self love. I love myself. Well, that's different than narcissism. Look at me. Yeah, my they've heart, got my confused. Cute, look at me. Look at my naked body. Look at my ass. It's so big. You know, it, it, <laughs> there. Again, getting back to what social media has done, it has confused people with what self-love is and self-worth and, again, an image of what you are. Mm. I was on the Thank phone. You. Yeah. I was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a grad student was interviewing me yesterday, um, a straight grad student kind of asking about the, the queer community for a, a paper they were writing. And one of the things that, I, I still find myself feeling very passionate about is the idea that sexual orientation has a very particular route for which we come out. You know, we come out as sexual beings. But when we look at the way sexuality functions in the brain, for the majority of us and in all of our autonomic nervous systems, we need an emotional intimacy to drive us towards sexual intimacy. And I was telling this young student, I wonder what, how we would identify and, and how our identities would develop if we had an emotional orientation as opposed to a sexual orientation. Yeah. We might prioritize how we connect and how we love and how we understand and empathize and practice vulnerability rather than what we do sexually with our bodies. I don't know why yes. I instinctively knew at 18, because we were each other's first boyfriend, first date, everything. But I just knew that if I didn't make him wait and get him to fall in love with me and get to know each other intimately first, that, that would be, it would just be the end of it. If we just went right for that from the start. So, yeah. And mentally, I was a little bit wired, like, okay, this is going to be sex. It'll be good. You know? Right. You know, this is a hookup. This is a, you know. It's, Even though like you never hooked up before. Yeah, right, right. But I mean, but you were I, eager to do it. Again, yeah. uh, it was a little bit part of the culture, too, in our culture. Yeah. You know, because From the 70s. came out sure. of the 70s. Yeah. The, sex the bathhouses. Free, the bathhouses, the gay, yeah. swinging, and everything. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, and again, Initially, I wasn't thinking long term. I was thinking immediate gratification. Right. Um, Which a lot of people think. Yeah. A lot of people think, mm -hmm. especially because of the apps. I do see a lot of people right now, maybe even the community at large, if I can be a little generalized here, having this internal debate. Am I one of the people who's okay with hookup culture and polyamory and open relationships? Or do I really crave monogamy? And they kind of consider, is it, is it more safe for me to be in this open relationship where I can have access to things that I need? Or is it safe for me to be in this monogamous relationship where we create security and belonging and, and trust? Not that there's not those things in polyamory. But I do think a lot of people find themselves questioning, is this... Uh, this kind of more enlightened or liberated sexuality and open relationships, the thing to do, or is there something more uh, important or special about monogamy? And I think that's a very good question for us. We we get, Go. we get that question asked to us often. Yeah. Um, and our, you know, our response is always, you know, this is something you have to find out on your own. It's you, you, you can't let somebody pressure you into it. You can't, uh, you can't um, not think about it. You have to find inside yourself what it is that you want. Do you want to know? And sometimes, you know, it, it, it requires maybe dabbling or experimenting to find out this is right for me. I'm good. This is not right for me. I mean, you can't just sit down and say, this is, this is what I want. Want. Uh, 
and and it'd be definite until you experience. Well, we know what all of it's like because we've we've experienced it all. And there wasn't really a difference as far as our relationship. I think, well, we were monogamous for the first 20 years. And then we decided, let's see what it's like to be with other guys just because, you know, we might regret it someday when we're decrepit and in the nursing home and you know yeah, why didn't we, yeah, <laughs> why didn't we? <laughs> hopefully we'll have real chairs next to each other so we can chat <laughs> but hopefully we'll have to get that. <laughs> yes hopefully not but you know so that's we, that's why we did that and that was a lot of fun and then we also tried polyamory at one point just because our attitude has always been just try things just to see what they're like and in the end we eventually came back to being monogamous because that's we're best just the two of us that's personal, though. I mean, anyone, I think if you have a strong relationship and you trust each other and there's love there, you could do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't, it won't affect your relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've seen couples go into a, uh, um, uh, a triad and come out of it destroyed. They're often destroyed, yes. And we've known those couples going into it were not stable, strong. They, they were looking for something to maybe make it more stable or strong, right. or somebody wanted something that the other one didn't, didn't want, want or pulled in. All those are wrong reasons. It's, you know, everyone has to be on board, stable and strong. Right. If you're going to go into a poly, poly, poly and amorous uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he actually, Dwayne would have wanted to open things up a little sooner than I did, but I wasn't ready so he waited for me i mean that's and it's no big he didn't deal. push you yeah know, you, you, you can't you you know again with your your partner your husband your your, your wife you you have really had again it's come back you got to be open and honest and right and you have to respect their feelings um, wait because yeah because well, when these people say to us what should i do my partner wants open relationship and i don't Every time we're like, well, you should be you talking to, to them, down, not us. And you yeah. have to sit down and you have to have a conversation and a very honest conversation, yeah. an open conversation. Tell them don't, what you're feeling. Don't tell us. I mean, we'll, we're, we're glad to give you our advice, but you two better get together or right. else you're in trouble. You know. Mm-hmm. If you're afraid to talk to him, that's a problem in your relationship. because That's should the be first able thing to you talk have to tackle then. Yes, you yeah. have to get on top of that and make sure that you can talk to anything about, well, to talk about anything with your spouse, yeah. your partner. Providing that safety, you need to be safe to say anything, to be exactly. naked, even in your cravings. Right. Yep. 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 Right. Exactly. Yes. And you know, to, don't worry about the fact that they might not approve. They might think it's wrong. It's bad. You might have something really kinky you're into. You might be, you know, you can't be embarrassed to tell your partner because that has to be the person that you're safest with. That's that's an issue I, I have with uh, younger generations that they're so overly concerned with being judged. It's okay to be judged. It's no reflection on you. Let someone judge you. That doesn't mean anything. You, if, if you're strong in who you are, that's bullshit. They say that to us a lot. Like in comments we get on so various social media, they ask us a question. They say, "Well, but you know, I'm not judging you. I'm like, I don't care if you, you judge me. Go ahead yeah, and judge. It doesn't okay. matter. It's you know, it's an okay thing to do. It's an okay yeah. to be judged. You, you just don't let it affect you personally. Right. Everyone's going to be it, judged. Maybe. Yeah. maybe you can learn from it. Maybe you can see yourself in a way maybe you haven't seen yourself. You know. Letting someone judge you in in this light almost sounds like a practice of self esteem. Yes. Yes. I, say, I, like, so. I yes. love myself, even if you're critiquing this or that about me, but I'm steadfast and that's a beauty right. according to me. Right. Yeah. If you really love yourself, re- not the narcissistic love yourself, but if you really love yourself, then you won't care about being judged mm-hmm. Yeah. by your partner or by the anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, I often think that for a lot of people, judgment, the, the history of judgment that they've lived through almost kind of creates the perception that to be safe is actually unsafe because now I'm open to being abandoned or rejected or falling in love and then being left. And so I think a lot of people who might hear this conversation say like, I really want what you guys have, but I don't know if I can trust safety. And I think that's a really unfortunate thing for, for many of us. It is. It is unfortunate. But then the question is, do you trust yourself? Ah, uh, right. Do you trust right, yourself? Right. right. You That's know, what it comes down to. Trust yourself. And then everything else out there is bullshit. Right. Trust yourself to keep... Wait, what's your language? Can I say that on... Can I say that on... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, trust yourself to keep yourself safe, even in relationships. Yeah, 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 yeah. As I, you, nodding your heads. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you see head nodding on a podcast. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> It'll sound funny though. All that empty. It'll sound- <laughs> <laughs> Chunk it, chunk it, chunk it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was uh, enjoying thumbing through your TikToks, and I absolutely love the the um, maybe the collection of photos that you all have from like photo booths and things like that. How has that been over the years? I was thinking of like picking up my phone and texting my partner, Joe, Joe, we got to do this. This is so cute. <laughs> That's what people have said to us. We have to do I've seen them tagging their their par- partners and saying, we need to do this. Yeah. Um, I got that from my mother. She photographed everything. I was always annoyed as a little boy because she always had the camera in her hand. I was like, Ma, leave me alone. But now I'm glad she did it because I have a great recording of my, my life and uh, my family's life. So I grew up thinking that's what you're supposed to do. You get married and you take lots and lots of pictures. So that's just what I did from the start. And I'm glad I did. And he, he's very loves himself. So he loves having his picture (laughs) taken. So it was easy. There was no, you know, get away, ma, get away, ma. No, no. He was like, I'm, Ready for my close up? I don't mind. Take a picture of me. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and growing up, my father always had the movie camera. So he was, and then he moved from movie cameras to video cameras. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess that's in both of us the idea of uh, documenting uh, your life through. But I, but you know, not just your life. I always thought that was a part of marriage that you're supposed, you have lots of uh, pictures. Uh, yeah. You know, you have lots of pictures and you record every moment together. I don't know why, but that's what I thought you're supposed to do. So I did it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's amazing. I'm glad you did because it's uh, quite a moment. <laughs> well, we are, Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I kind of say that from a particular perspective, but I'm 37 and it's uh, when I definitely remember, I mean, even still to this day, but in my 20s and my early 30s, it was a, a craving within me to say, I want to see a version of what my life looks like out in front of me. I want to know what being married to a man looks like. I want to know what a healthy relationship looks like between two yeah. men, not having those examples um, to see kind of the chronology and your, the longevity that the two of you have created is just so fun. It paints a picture for all of us in terms of happiness. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. Well, no, thank you. But we didn't have any to look at and, and say, except our parents except our parents but you know in as, as, gay as gay men we didn't have any um, role models role models thank you so where I'm looking for any role models um, but we knew what we wanted and it was you know damn everyone if they don't want us to have it this is what we want and even like when we first met and we were said we want to get married um, all of our gay friends were like, "We need married. Gay men don't get married." You know, that was the, the, the that was the uh, social yeah, psychology like, at that time. We didn't have pushback from straight people. They were like, "Oh, that's great. That's so sweet." But, yeah, it was gay people, people telling us, "Oh, why do you want to do that? Right. We're supposed to be promiscuous." Be promiscuous. You're supposed to yeah, you don't get married. You can't get married. There's no such thing. And and it was yeah. Our gay friends were like, I mean, our straight friends. They were like, "Yeah, you're right. You should be able. You should be married." Right. right. So, um, what was my point here? Wait, we're talking about. I don't <laughs> I he does this all the time. He start. He gets onto a really good point. I'm like, but what was the question yeah, originally? I don't what, remember. Was there a <laughs> but it was good. But I don't think it answered the question. But it was good. But was there a question? Sure. Was I just making a point? <laughs> he was talking about the pictures and how it gives people no, 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 a no, but we positive image right, of it. Right, right, but that, that was the positive image thing that I took into. We didn't have, but we made our own. Okay. Yeah. Again, which I don't know how that helps anybody. <laughs> but that was really nice to hear that from you, though, because I never thought about that. The fact that seeing these pictures of us gives people hope for their future. It's really nice. Oh, right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. And I, it's it kind of, in there. Yes. Yeah, this, this gratitude for this review and that, that not only your history and your insights today in the conversation, but the photos are, it's a, it, is, it serves as a role model many of us to say this is what it looks like to grow up with each other to to be with each other by each other's side and to still see in your tiktoks the love and the humor um 
the connection. It's just such a beautiful role, you know, role modeling for all of us. Thank you. If, yeah, I I mean, I I hope if we can like inspire at least somebody or, you know, that that's a wonderful thing. That feels great. I hope you can also show people that it was not a horrible time for us when we were in the 80s and 90s, because they often say that, wow, all we see in the media are depictions of gay people from that time period that are really depressing, really maudlin and tragic. And they're shocked to see these videos of us where we're just like having fun and being silly. Like they didn't even think that that was possible. I thought we all just sort of (laughs) marched around with sad looks on our faces. So it's good to be able to let them know, no, we were happy. You can be happy too. It's, it's it's all possible. It's obtainable. Yeah. Yeah. You said this, Dwayne, and you said it almost as, as though it's a product of 40 years worth of marriage, but you said we were respecting their feelings. I was respecting his feelings. And that's a statement that I think comes with years of growth because I don't think many people know how to lovingly respect their spouse's feelings and just letting it be a feeling, not a personal attack or the opinion that has to win. What is that? uh, How have you guys practiced that? I mean, that's a beautiful boundary to respect each other's feelings, even at the point of saying, I want to sleep with other people. I mean, that's, that's incredible safety and stamina. Yeah. And he was saying that very early on, actually. That you wanted to like open up. Oh yeah, but that's not the point here. The point here. I know, is... I'm throwing it in. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. <laughs> no, you threw me off. Um, <laughs> uh, it just, uh, it just seems human to respect another human's point of view and feelings, even if you don't agree with it, um, and. You mean whether you're in a relationship with them or not, you're saying? Right, right, right. And what, you know, when you're in a relationship, it's a different dynamic because uh, you need to, um, we hear, if it's outside of a relationship and you don't uh, agree with somebody, you don't have to deal with that person. That's fine. You walk away, that person's not a part of your life. But when you're in a relationship, you need to um understand their, where they're coming from with their feelings and, and point of view, and then either help them to change it if it's not healthy or just accept it and, and work with it. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, I guess it's the old adage, whatever, uh, you, you, can, you don't change what you can't. I, I forget how it goes, but in a relationship, you can change the way your partner thinks or feels if it's not uh, good for them or healthy, or you see that this is something that's troubling them. Um, and you just have to, yeah, you really have to be open and willing to work with that. And I guess it comes from a point of self-examination. You know, I, I guess you usually spend a lot of your life examining yourself and wondering, why am I doing this? Is this something that's good? Why am I this way? Uh, being this way is causing me to feel this way and I don't like to feel this way. So I have to stop doing this. I, I think growth, personal growth and, and, and relationship growth is constant is, is, and, and being human is a natural uh, part of self-examination. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And if you stop, I think you, you stop growing as a human when you stop when you stopped, uh, you know, uh, self-examination, self-reflection, self-examination, mm-hmm. and that doesn't, that's, that, that is not related by what's going on out there. It's, it's what's going on affected inside by. of you, affected by, yeah, not affected by what's going on outside in society, um, but it, it, it's what's going on inside of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like what you're saying here, because it's, it's like we don't even stop growing personally, but we stop growing relationally when we can't. Mm assess who am I and what are my motives and how are those creating my behaviors? You know, and I, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I think that sometimes, I think this is maybe one of the most important pieces for 
a, a healthy relationship, and I, I really do believe this, but when we can learn how to respect the feelings of our partner, in some ways we're protecting the relationship from our own immaturity. Because I'm thinking of a mm. couple in this, you know, one partner saying, hey, let's open up, and the other person saying, oh, no. The person asking might say, well, this is my life. This is my comfort. This is my sexuality. What do you mean? No, I'm out of here. And that their immaturity can override what's actually um, important or what makes a, a relationship right. last. And I think, I mean, this respect right. that you guys have for wow. feelings is amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the, yeah, you, you there, there, yeah. Was that? There's, there's, there's compromise in a relationship. You know, there, there's, there's compromise. Um, you don't have to compromise. Uh, I, I often people ask, uh, uh, I always say, you know, if you're going into a relationship, never compromise who you are, but you need compromise in a relationship because you need to be uh, uh, cognitive, is that the right word? Cognitive. Cognitive of your... <laughs> Of your partner's feelings, thoughts, desires, um, the emotions, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. The word that we use here in the clinic is negotiate, you know, to say um, almost like two business partners coming together to strike a deal to say, I don't know if I can give you that, but I can give you this. And the mm -hmm. other. Person, right. You know, I don't have to, I can, I can settle with that and I will be happy and we can function as two partners creating something together. And I think I agree with right. you. that negotiation or the, that compromising is so important as long as it's not part of the person's identity or the personhood. Right. Right, right, right. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. I said it or not. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah. That's what you meant. That's what I meant. <laughs> you said it better. <laughs> I practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yes i was gonna say like like when i corrected him like that doesn't bother him like things like that like it i think i see we see these younger couples they're so obsessed with image i think that would destroy them to be corrected by their their husband in in public and Dwayne doesn't mind me making a fool of him. So I love, that's, it comes that's down to being confident in who you are and knowing yeah. who you are. Right, you know, exactly. That's, that's, that's not going to damage me. Right, <laughs> right. Maybe it could in some relationships, and maybe it's unhealthy in some relationships. But uh, Well, we're not talking about abuse, but we're right. talking about you know, lighthearted. Right. Well, right. that's why we have... That's why we share a similar sense of humor. And I guess that's right. something that's, mm -hmm. again... So we keep saying it's, the sense of humor is key. Yeah. A relationship. Mm -hmm. And again, if you can't laugh at yourself, you can't laugh. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What y'all are talking around here, I've been thinking about this as I'm watching the two of you, but it almost seems like in a very beautiful way, humility to say, I love who I am and my partner makes me better. And so I can let them correct me or we can laugh about it. And it's just this really... Right. Yeah this really cool humility. Yeah. I never yeah. thought, I never put I it never, that way, but yeah, 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 it's true. That's what it is. See, that's why he's, you know, who he is. So he is, who he is and that's where we are on this <laughs> side of the computer and he's on that side. Yes. <laughs> that's why you're in your position <laughs> <laughs> on top. See, he's above, above and we're below. Right, yes. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which people can't see on the podcast, but well, yeah. Well, if those on who are listening, we're on Zoom and he's above us. And we're yes, and we're on the bottom. We're inferior, but it's Teaching, okay. learning. Yes. <laughs> yes. On my screen, we're side by side. Yeah. You know, we're, we're equal. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Wait, I didn't... Wait, wait. Can we do that? No, we're still... So... You have I could change it. Yeah, I like it this way. I like it this way. I like it this way. One of the things that I wanted to... Um, just use as maybe some levity or to ask about, but you guys, uh, there was a season where you guys had a, a lot of muscles. You guys grew and it was really in, in some of your montages to see kind of in the nineties, I think it was when you guys really bulked up. No, it was up until last year. Oh, Cause we, it the gym started in the night. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, Cause our biggest, we were our, we're at our biggest at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And then pandemic came, the gyms closed in March. 
And yeah, that was the first, how. yeah, that was the first <laughs> time we, everyone says that they gained a lot of weight during the pandemic. We lost about 30 pounds each. Yeah. Wow. Just all the muscles, sh- you know, shrunk. So we, we were, hard we're really looking forward to going back. Like yeah. we're going to go back <laughs> next week. That's fun. I mean, hard gainers and we, um, that, that, you know, like we always tell people, have an activity you can do with your partner that you both enjoy. And for us, it was going to the gym. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we weren't set setting out, oh, I got to be, you know, reach a certain size. But it just, it, it became an activity that we enjoyed together. Yeah. And um, I know we didn't make sit down and say, let us now be muscular guys. It no, just, we it just be happened. We want to bears or whatever. Yeah. You know, it, it, again, we weren't going for an image, but an image happened would, upon us. Right. Um, but yeah, it was an activity we enjoyed together. And you know what? It makes you feel better, too, when you're working out regularly. Yeah, because, you know, we never felt our age until this past year. And yeah. suddenly we looked at each other after many months of not working out. We're like, oh, my God, we got old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so hopefully we can reverse some things this year. Sure. Yeah. I don't know if you guys feel this, but I do. But it's I feel like I feel lucky for being gay and having a male partner because in this sort of way, like having these activities together and seeing your photos. And it's almost like, I feel like straight people have this in their own way, but we get kind of this ability to have our lover be our best friend in the same way that a straight man would have a best friend in childhood. You know, like, it's like, we get, we get kind of that dual love, if you will. And watching you guys kind of, I love that one TikTok where it was like, I think it was the 80s and the 90s kind of circled back to the 80s or whatever it was. But it was just so fun to see the best friend nature of your relationship coinciding with the love of your relationship. That's nice. And that's another part of a relationship, being friends. We've always noticed that, though, about straight couples that we've been friends with that have also been together a long time. They always have separate friends and they do separate activities. The women go off with their girlfriends and do this. And yeah, we've, we've never had that. We do everything together. We are each other's best friends. You know, we've known one straight couple where it's their best friends and they don't, they're always together, you know, and they do everything together and they have a very healthy relationship. Um, so I, I, I think friendship is also part of Who are you talking about? your relationship. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I say the name. <laughs> uh, um, so what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, relations. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, that gay couples have uh, they have we, a special have, because unique because right, we, we can be like each other's best be, friend, right? Right. Because, right, 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 right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes, both being both of the same sex, you can share things as yes. friends would. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Girlfriends, boyfriends, yes. Right. Any last thoughts <laughs> you wish the, the queer community could hear? Something funny, something insightful? Um, just be, it's so, it, it sounds cliche, but it's the mo- number one question we're asked most often. And we have to say, just be who you are be your authentic i don't even know if they know what authentic means anymore because everyone's always saying using the throwing the word authenticity around to the point where it doesn't have any meaning anymore but just whatever your natural inclination or interest is go with that and don't think i have to you don't have to fit into a i have to like drag because i'm gay or i have to like this kind of music or i have to dress this way or i have to paint my fingernails you don't have to do anything you're just a person you're just an individual and just whether you're straight or gay or bi or any, whatever, you just do what you want to do. And don't let those outside influences tell you what you are, who you are, what you should be, when you should be. Um, it's, it almost seems easier said than done because it's so difficult in, in such a uh, multimedia society we live in and a techni- technology that we live in. But really, it's it's don't let anything else tell you what or who you should be. Um, but be a nice person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but don't be afraid of who you are, because right. that's be another thing we've seen right. numerous. Do I have another moment to 
to talk or okay no we've seen numerous tiktoks of younger gay guys talking about how they're afraid to go to the mechanic they're afraid to go to home depot because there are macho straight guys there and i'm i'm they're gonna i don't understand why they assume anyone that works anywhere is straight or gay just from looking at them or why they assume that any straight guy is going to be homophobic and want to beat them up i mean we've never ever experienced that we will we go anywhere and we're always who we are and we'll go to the mechanic or we'll go anywhere Mm -hmm. so the fact that not just one but i've seen multiple instances of younger gay guys talking about that it means that they're not confident in who they are or in in anyone they they assume anyone's going to attack them they want they think they feel victimized at all times and i think that comes from not um, being secure in who you authentically are and feeling they have to put on this gay personality or a straight personality. I don't even know what any of that means, but does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I think it's, um, I do, I do definitely appreciate what you're saying in the sense that when it feels like being gay means you have to play a role, then it also we, we not only assume the role, but then we assume all of the fear and insecurity of the role. Right. I don't think anyone has to know whether you're straight and gay at all times. Where If you're going to Home Depot, why does anyone care or need to know anything about you? I mean, they don't know if you're straight or gay or whatever. They just want to sell you something. So <laughs> you shouldn't worry. I'm gay. I can't go to Home Depot. I don't... I don't I don't get it. Yeah. I think a lot of people, I I wonder if it's some of the um, identification of like toxic masculinity in the sense that, you know, if I'm gender queer and I'm walking into Home Depot with high heels and makeup as a, as a male, then um, the toxic masculinity is really unsafe. I'm not sure, but, but I do think that there is that persona, you know, this is what it means to be gay. It means, I adopt a persona rather than let my true authenticity shine. That's right. where the mistake That's is. where the mistake is. That's a mistake. Right. You know, you can, uh, I mean, we've all maybe adapted, you know, a, a personality or persona and maybe gone out, you know, to a club or something. And it's kind of fun. But don't let that rule your life that this is how you have to be because you're gay. That's, that's where the mistake is. And again, if it is, you want to, you know, put on your, uh, put on your drag, uh, you put it on and you go to Home Depot, you go, you go where you want to go and be confident in it. This is me. I love it. You know, I see a lot of, I disappear. I see a lot of people, you know, talking about how, uh, you know, how confident they are doing this, in their safe space at home but you know you have to go out of your safe space it's a hard thing to do but leave your safe space um and it may not be as bad as you think you know and i know the big big point about location location location, where you live you know you live somewhere where you're not going to feel safe in that I understand. Yeah. You may have to keep that to yourself. Uh, I mean, I get that. That's an issue that that's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's the outside uh, um, negative influence, but again, still you need that self-confidence. You need to live in that Mm -hmm. self-confidence. But again, back to what we said, you don't have to be anything. If it's not you, you don't have to be anything. It's not you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, from time to time on the show, I reference my slight addiction for TikTok. But it was through TikTok that I found their example of what it might look like for me to be a married queer person. An an example that brings me such comfort. And as we listen to this show, I really do ponder, how have our lives been dramatically changed by social media? Does it really put that kind of pressure on us to curate a life, to be seen a certain way, and therefore another pressure to actually have that life when the camera's turned off and the the Snapchat is closed? What would my life look like if I didn't have a mirror? I often think about 
What would my authenticity be like if there were no cameras? If there was no Instagram for me to post what I thought was cool, but also if I didn't have the pressure to collect the outfits and the sunglasses and the hairdos that made me look cool. As I watch these two happy married men express the joy over a life